Recently, I got a question in the Facebook group asking, what do you do with study hall? And this is a question that is not going to be for everyone, but it is definitely going to be for someone. And what I want to share with you today with regards to study hall is not necessarily how you have to do anything more. It's just how you could maybe do a few things differently that are going to help you to really have a study hall that isn't draining your energy, right? So you, when I think of like my first years of teaching and trying to navigate study hall, study hall is typically a class where I was trying to get stuff done. I needed kids to be quiet and stay seated so they could get stuff done. And what the hope is that we are, what we're doing is like giving kids extra time to get work finished, to get help with stuff. But the problem is like, I'm good at English. I'm, I don't teach math for a reason. I know history, but not everything that kids always need to do. I don't know all teachers, so I'm not sure what the expectations have been with regard to like their projects and stuff like that. So study hall can be this kind of like a dumping ground for too many kids in an overcrowded classroom with you don't know what the heck to do with them. So I want to talk to you today with a few ideas of how I have found study hall to be a great time of the day, one of my favorite times often, and how I kind of got to that place from this madhouse to something that is enjoyable, is life-giving, and the kids walk away with something. So first, it, it, I think the first thing when you're thinking about study hall is that you have to know like what your school rules are, right? So if you don't, I don't want to tell you anything that your school is going to tell you differently. So your school might have rules where the kids are supposed to be doing a specific activity. They are supposed to be using the time for something um, that, you know, that the school has dictated is important. And so whatever I'm saying, that's going to be your, you making that decision, whether or not you want to do it or not. I often lean to, and I'm not telling anyone to get in trouble, but I'm just saying that I often lean towards uh, asking for forgiveness over permission because sometimes I think schools have the best of intentions and that they have these really great ideas that are well-meaning in theory, but in practice, they don't really work out. And that's a whole nother rabbit hole that we could go down, but it's figuring out that. I think the next part is what do you need, right? And so when you think about this period, are you teaching six periods a day, you're teaching the majority of your day and now you have this added study hall? Or is this one of the, like counts as like a class period that you have? So I've had both. I've taught five periods and then this was my sixth period of the day, which left me with only two preps, which we all know is not enough time. It's two like 40 to 50 minute periods to get everything else done, not happening. So what I found is that I had to figure out what do I need in that? Do I need peace and quiet? Do I need time to get my planning done? Do I just need time to give my brain a break? Do I need time to do grading? Do I need time to tutor other students? Do I need time to create space for students to come in and retake uh, assessments or make up work? So it's really getting clear, right? So getting clear on what you need that time for. Here's what a lot of us do, I think, right? I'm going to make a jump and make an assumption because I know I'm just basing this off my own my, what I what I've done in the past is sometimes what we need is not communicated or not thought through. And so planning for what you need is going to take is going to be way different than just showing up and trying to figure out that day. Like, what are we doing? How do I keep these kids quiet? Oh, my gosh, you're making me sweat so much. I have to bring extra shirt to school. It, it is a uh, true story. So it's thinking about what you might need in that time. Then you want to this can be an ask too, right? Just because you ask right on the front end, let's say this, just because you ask students their opinion doesn't mean you have to honor that opinion or give them what they want. I often ask my kids, what do you want for dinner? And my son says, well, he wants water ice because we're from Philly or, uh, or in Philly, water ice or ice cream. Bro, I'm not giving you ice cream for dinner. Every once in a while, every once in a while, I'll tell you what, I want to be a rad dad and I do it, but, uh, you know, just because you ask doesn't mean you have to do it. But I think you could ask your students, what do your students want? Or actually, I'm going to scrap that. What do your students need, not want? Here's why. Wants just because, it, that's just, I, I think it is a breeding ground perhaps 
for disaster. What the students need in that time, you have a lot of different students and don't ask them audibly. I would hand out some sort of like, have them email you, hand out a tracker, make a Google form really quick. That's like, what do you need from study hall? And I think the interesting thing about this is not to just look at the answers that you get from students, but think about how those answers, like you might be able to, to kind of mesh with some of those, right? Sometimes kids need quiet. Sometimes kids need chill time. Sometimes kids might ask to talk with friends, to work with others, to retake assessments or make up assignments or go and talk to a teacher real quick that is that has a prep that period also. It is finding out what those students need. And you know, when I think about this, when I think about kids asking for things like to just put their head down, to listen to music, to play a game on their computer, to doing things like that, that can immediately be a red flag to schools and something that teachers often throw out immediately. But if I think about my student's school day, school, if you want breakfast, right? We have free and reduced program for breakfast for everyone. You have to show up uh, between seven o'clock and 7.30, right? We then have classes, 52 minute classes. I think the math works out like this. I think it's 52 minute periods. Um, and we have, uh, students have eight of those. Then there is, we have a three story school with no elevator for students. Um, 500 students in the school, it's a very small school. Uh, so there are only three minutes between periods to get from one place to the other, that's it, right? So this is not like time to talk, it's not time to mess around, it's not even time really to go to the bathroom. You have to like hustle because there's only two bathrooms in the school, so those are very, very crowded at that time. Then students get a 22 minute lunch period. And that's it, there is, oh, my bad. Then they go to school till, uh, depending on the year, right, but usually, it has been till um, 4 p.m. So the end of the day is 4 p.m. And then for freshmen, sophomores, and juniors, mandated after school program that you don't always get to pick until 5 p.m. All right, so then we're thinking about this. Now in the city, might be different where you're from, the commute for some students is five minutes because they live right across the street and in the neighborhood of West Philadelphia. But if you live in Northeast Philly, there are students that will take walk, walk to the L, take it. This is my train, take a train. Then they're going to take the train to the bus. Then some students have to take another bus until that kid finally walks home from the bus stop, right? So sometimes students don't get home till seven o'clock PM. Then we load them up with homework and kids are doing homework or not doing homework because it's a late day and this becomes a very late day. So what we're saying to kids is that sometimes this commute has to happen in the morning. You get to school, the only time you get to talk to anyone else to explore, express your feelings, talk about your thoughts, talk about what happened last night, be an actual human being and not bell to bell instruction is in the three minutes that you have going from one class to another or in the 22 minutes at lunch. That's it. And I think that this is a total disaster. That is why I run my study hall in a time that kids can talk, that kids can take a break, that kids can listen to music. Now, I do have rules, but I'm just saying, I'm gonna get into how I run that, but that's, there's, that's just one thought to go into this. Now, look, there's two different types of downtime, right? So I'm not just talking about kids like just sleeping or something like that, right? Um, although, you know, that's arguable. So if you look at the science, two types of downtime. One uh, is kind of like leisure activities. Now, this is what is known as, we're going to put this in purple and red. This is fake downtime. This is why this is fake downtime. Trying to, trying to not go super, super duper fast here. Um, this can be stuff like reading a book, talking to friends, doing a puzzle. Here's why this doesn't count 
in science as downtime because <clears throat> these activities all require you to process information. You have to think. You are consumed with something you are thinking about, processing, trying to come up with, right? So when it requires actual, the processing of information, then it doesn't count as actual downtime. Downtime meaning time where your brain can recuperate, it can take a breather, you're, you can take a, a, take a beat, right? And so that, this is still better than just making kids work, 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 but it is something that is known as fake downtime. Now, true downtime, um, true downtime is anything where you are allowing your mind to wander, right? Which is really funny. When you look at the science of this, and you look at the neurology behind this, right? Um, it is this idea that students let, or adults, letting your mind wander, not particularly thinking about any particular thing, but just kind of spacing out, actually gives your brain a break and helps you to go into the rest of your day better. So um, if you're wandering around, if you're spacing, if, if you're just spacing out, that is actually good for your brain to have that rest. Now look, this can also, right? I, I, I taught, I taught for long enough that I know that this can also lead to nonsense, right? This leads to like kids, like, I don't know, shooting paper clips at one another, chucking pencils, like touching other people, doing whatever else they're doing. So a, a way that you can still achieve this is by doing what we think of as like a mindless activity, right? So if you give a kid a task to do, um, it might be, stapling papers it might be pulling staples out of a out of a bulletin board it might be re, like removing the whole bulletin board like all the stuff on it it could be uh you know like coloring playing with a rubik's cube doing something that is allowing your mind to to still take a break to still think but you are kind of doing something that is mindless that is uh like filing or or alphabetizing something those sorts of activities can actually still give kids that same break and so this is why they say that most folks, this is many of you may think this too, that you get really good ideas in the shower because your brain is actually taking a break. You're doing something mindless that your hands can just do anyway. You're, how often are you thinking about like washing my arm, washing my arm, washing the other side of my arm? Uh, you get to take a moment, take a break. No one's bothering you and you know no one's going to bother you. Well, unless you have little kids and then we all know how that rolls. But, uh, the, but you get really good ideas in the shower. So... With all this said, right, I want to walk through real quick my how I run my particular study halls, how they have evolved over time. I used to tell kids that they had to do work for a class. I used to tell kids that they had to be doing um, something meaningful, not just something stupid. Like you couldn't like draw a picture, right? I, and I realized my language here, right? Something stupid. Um, but this is this is old Reynolds, right? I've evolved. It is this idea of drawing a picture was not allowed. Um, playing a game on your computer was not allowed. Um, working on a puzzle, coloring something, uh, writing a note to your friend, like these were things, as if anyone does that anymore, but like these were activities that I did not allow. Now, my rules are this, right? One, you gotta come in and sit in your assigned seat, right? This is only for it, for attendance purposes. I don't want to, and I have a whole video on this on like uh, how I do seating charts, but I'm looking for spaces, not faces. So I'm looking for first row, so that second seat's empty, Antoine's not here. And if I say Antoine's not here and then Antoine goes, no, 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 I'm here. Now you're late because you made me look twice. So just be in the regular seat that you need to be in so I can give you as much time as you need to do the thing that you're going to do. Then once attendance is taken, you can move. But once you move seats, I don't really care where you're sitting, right? We will do, I, don't, I don't make rules based on, um, I had a mentor one time that put it like this. So I'm not saying any student is actually a lowest common denominator, but the mentor told me we often make rules in society based on the lowest common denominator. So saying teachers that often make rules or make punishments that punish the entire class because of how one person was acting, I am, not, I am not willing to project into the future that 
a student or three students or even five students out of 30 that I have in a study hall are going to make poor choices. I'm not going to base my rules on those five kids when the majority of students are doing a good job. I will handle kids that are problematic when I need to handle them individually, but I will not put a penalty on the whole class. So you can move seats. The problem is your actual butt needs to touch the actual seat, right? We need cheeks in seats. That's the whole rule in the class, right? So, um, and I don't recommend using that terminology if it feels weird to you, but uh, that's why I tell kids because it rhymes and makes kids sit down. So um, if you are sitting somewhere, I don't even care if you move, but you have to be sitting in a seat. Having a conversation with a kid that they're not allowed to be somewhere or that they have to sit down is a lot different than saying, hey, can you just make sure you sit? I don't really care where you sit. I just need you to be sitting, sitting down. Um, that is, is something that like no one's going to argue with you about. And if they do, then you have that conversation. Hey, do you realize I'm letting you sit anywhere that you want? Um, I'm not giving you any actual work to do. All I just need you to do is sit down because I don't want you to trip over anything um, because I can't see everyone in the room. And so would you do me a favor and just please sit down? That's it. That's how I, I pose it to kids. Puts the decision making in their hands. And if they choose not to do it, then we have a different kind of conversation. The third thing is um, I discuss what is the time used for. So I don't just leave it up to kids. Find something to do. Think of something to do. Do you have work? Do it. I want to run through things. And so oftentimes you can even just keep a list a very simple list on your board, right? Of bullet points of these are things that you could use during this time. Now, I choose to allow students to do other things other than work. So, and this is up to you and it goes back to the school rule thing. If a kid wants to play a game on their computer and they're quiet, if they are even watching a show, like a lot of my students are into anime, a lot of that stuff is subtitled anyway, I just figure you're reading anyway. If you are working on a project, if you are want to do a coloring page, I keep coloring pages in my room. If you want to use Play-Doh, I have Play-Doh in my room. I have a lot of different other sort of manipulatives that are going to allow kids that sort of actual downtime to refresh their brain so they can go into their next class feeling good. Things you're not allowed to do. Sleep, unless you are, like, unless it's a, I can see this is a situation that's needed. You had a hard night, something happened that morning. You need that breather. I allow students to do that if needed. Um, but that's a, that's few and far between, and they are very specific cases. Uh, but that is that is a choice that I make personally. Um, so it's giving kids those options of what to do. And then the other thing that I find uh, is that, you know, I don't want to, if I need this time for something, I don't want to be asked about things like using the restroom, right? So the bathroom pass is free, is at the front of the classroom. Um, and it's just one person at a time. You don't have to ask me. Don't go two people at a time. If you don't see the pass there, then someone's not there. They're at the bathroom. And if you have someone that goes to the bathroom for 30 minutes, then we have that conversation with that student, right? But I'm not signing passes. I'm not messing around. I'm not having the conversation about, can you go to the bathroom? Of course, you're, you're like a human being. Go to the bathroom if you need to, but you can only do one at a time because guess what? Two people in the bathroom standing next to one another gets weird. So this is how I roll that out. Now I will say this, the other thing that I find is really, really useful um, is in a corner of the room, and I'd almost put this as like a number five, this is a thing that I do. I have a corner of the room where I spend time talking with kids. I have decided that my study hall will not be used as a time where I'm prepping, right? Because like it's, I have my ADHD, like I can't focus when, when we're doing that anyway. Um, so in real short, cause I don't want this video to go on too long is that I have a time where I'm talking to kids about problems. We are sometimes like going through like cultural events, things that happen in the news, something that happened that popped up yesterday or, or something kids saw online and they want to have a conversation about it. Because I think that often, like I say all the time, kids are told to speak when spoken to, and then are never spoken to. So giving students a safe space to air what they are thinking and feeling and going through. Um, and then, you know, sometimes it's playing Uno with kids, right? Just playing Uno because you can still talk while you're doing that. So you have something to do and you're talking, never playing cards, cards, because that leads to like money and gambling and that's a whole nightmare. But playing Uno, I think is fine. Um, or I will sometimes, if 
kids are just kind of like sitting there like lumps, I'll go, yo, listen, I, I need to know something. I'll ask questions like this. Um, I am, uh, I need to know what is cool that is happening in the world of like in the teenage world that I don't know about right now. Like, what do I need to know about? And this is always a good question because it allows students to talk about something that they know the best then. And so what show is really great right now? What comic book is everyone reading? What, what song is popping off right now? What is something in, um, on TikTok that is huge or a meme or something I keep hearing everyone say in the building all the time. And now uh, I, get, I ask students like, yo, what, what, what is this meme? I keep hearing the kids saying like, oh, Reynolds, that's this meme. And so it is a time to kind of like, to dive into the world of your students. And I'm telling you this, that this is not wasted time. This time that you spend with kids is going to be something, and you could do this as a group. You could do this as moving around and speaking with different groups. I often do that too. It is meaningful time where you are letting kids know that they are seen, that you care, and you're not just saying you care because love is a verb and it can't just be said. It has to be shown. So we are showing kids that love, that kindness, that affection, that attention. They are giving the students the presence of our presence. And so that is time that is spent doing that. And that will pay in dividends that go well beyond study hall. Not only will it help students to behave, it will help students to check in with you later. It will help kids to talk to you in the hallway. It will build a culture of care in your building. It will allow students a place that they know someone cares about them so they can come back later. And that's a whole other thing we could talk about later. But um, I, so this is like, these are just some of the ways that you're going to see that this actually like you benefit your class, your school benefits from you spending time with students in this particular way. Now, whether that's the one-on-one -on -one time with kids or it is spending and giving kids that space in study hall, kind of deal with that. So that's how we're dealing with it. I'd love to know, and I'm sure other people would too, do you have any specific issues around, um, around your study hall and like how have you found ways to deal with them? If you could put those in the comment section below, that'd be great. And it would just would create a resource that even five years from now, someone's watching this and they're like, oh yeah, I identify with that. How did they navigate that? That's really going to help people. Anything else you need, you can go right over to realrapwithreynolds.com or hit us up on our Facebook group, Real Rap with Reynolds Teacher Talk, which is a great place to have more conversations like this and to get to know teachers that see things uh, just like you and maybe the opposite way of you and challenge you. But that's it for this week, gang. Peace.